2014, there was an extensive, um, uh, 2013 and 14, there was an extensive process of review where there was a great, uh, great number of consultations through the Mental Health uh, Drug and Alcohol Office, as it was then, um, about changes that could be made to the Mental Health Act. And we advocated for a number of changes and some of them were picked up and implemented. Uh, <coughs> and so, uh, importantly, there has been a focus on recovery-oriented language and ideas being incorporated into the Mental Health Act, but there's also been um, some significant concentration on the way in which carers are recognised and the way in which they are uh, engaged in the treatment and support of their loved ones. So the Act was amended in 2014 after a number of consultations. Uh, the changes were passed in 2014 and they were proclaimed and made legally effective actually on the 31st of August 2015. This is the idea that we're engaging people and that we're doing treatment and planning with them instead of to them. A designated carer basically is the rebadged primary carer role and this is the person who is selected by the consumer themselves. They can now pick up to two designated carers and they have exactly the same rights as the primary carer. The principal care provider is the new role and this is the one that we actually advocated for because we understand that sometimes, particularly if you wait until a person's acutely unwell before you ask them the question, um, the person might not be in the best position or willing indeed to nominate the person who's actually supporting them in the community as someone who should be entitled to get a bit more information or to participate in helping plan their eventual discharge. Both types of carer have the same enhanced rights as primary carers did to receive information and to participate in care planning. Um, the experiences, when I, when I was asked to sit on the panel, I actually sent out an email to all my other co-workers and got lots of replies. So I'd like to give you a, a bit of a view from right across um, our areas. Um, the experiences that um, we've found is that it's, it's having a positive impact on carers. Um, I've had some really positive feedback. There, there are some glitches though and um, the very fact that um, the wording designated carer and principal care provider, some people are still unsure what that means. You know, I've been asked questions like, does that mean I'm part of, you know, part of the guardianship board or something like that. So it's um, very unclear. When I actually sat um, in a meeting with an executive um, meeting at Nolan House and I asked all the, the psychiatrists and senior staff members there and they said that the changes are really positive. They're actually um, at something that forms have been filled out every time someone's admitted. Um, and also I went around to a couple of different community mental health um, areas and spoke to the managers and one was really positive. Lots of, lots of forms being filled out. And one was negative. She hasn't seen the form at all. So um, I'm getting that form to her. So, but across the board, um, very positive feedback. Being, carers being engaged in care planning and that. I spoke to a carer and uh, this is what she said to me. She's, um, she's being treated with respect, consulted and listened to and her views are taken into consideration in any reviews concerning her son and his CTO. The level of, level of inclusion has kept her son out of hospital and maintains his accommodation, also the relationship with the family. And she's feeling more empowered and relaxed. And in her words, she said, I'm not having to go in fighting and justifying why I want to keep my son safe. And if this means he continues with a CEO, um, CTO, then that needs to happen. So that was really positive. I'm hoping that's right across the board, but that was great. She's been doing it a long time and has had to do a lot of fighting over the years. So um, My experience is based on a sample of one trying to process help and stand alongside my wife if she accesses help. First comment is, because we have a changing system of registrars through the hospital, the approach they take is remarkably different. And depending on how much they have or have not been told about the changes, you, I will or will not be told information about what's going on. 
I've never ever been consulted about medication or treatment plans or anything like that. I've merely been told medication is going to change from X to Y, levels going to change from Y to Z, and I might find out afterwards, and again, even under the new, ch new changes, I'm not told things like it may increase a risk of suicidality. With our daughter, who has uh, bipolar 1, it wasn't, it was over years and years before we finally got a psychiatrist that would accept me with my daughter's therapy. And uh, over the years, they all pushed me away and said, no, you know, you, you can't come, you can't um, know anything about her medication or anything. And then finally got a new psychiatrist and unfortunately had to pay a lot of money in a private hospital to get all this. And uh, we haven't looked back because he said that uh, our daughter was, um, I had to be there at every session because she had no insight into her illness. And unless I was there to verify what she was saying was true or false, um, and then it took quite some time before she took the medication. And, and now he informs me and, um, and I think that goes along with the Mental Health Act, which now the principal, they can advise you and talk to the family members. And uh, that's, that's so far been a good thing. So um, I'm still to learn a lot more. I'm finding that um, last year when my son was in hospital for four and a half months, we had good communication with the hospital and I was really surprised about how included we were in his treatment. And I thought, wow, this is so different compared to what it was in the past. This year we've had the worst outcome ever. Um, we've been excluded from uh, his treatment plan. We weren't told... Um, about his uh, community treatment order for the date for the hearing, so uh, we were rang after it. I did say at a family meeting that I was writing a letter to go with the CTO paperwork, um, so needless to say that didn't go ahead about my concerns for my son. Um, he's been released into the community with no insight. Um, we were told that he should not return home because he was too much of a danger to us but they were willing to send him to Canberra where he had no family, no support, never lived there before. Um, so where is safety in discharge? We have not seen our son for four and a half months. Uh, we've been excluded from the ward from the hospital because of his um, illness that he has refused to see us. Um, we weren't told that we could apply, get the doctor to apply for the primary care provider. Is that the We've done a lot of searching and familiarising ourselves with the process and the changes and how it affects us. And I've actually got a daughter in a unit at the moment, so it all became you know, very necessary to know. And we're finding that we're actually um, in an ad adversarial situation with the people treating. <coughs> that we're not welcomed, we're not valued for what we can offer, we're set aside. We're, we're and using the things like um, not being nominated or not being a designated carer, so much so that she, my, when my daughter becomes unwell, she normally excludes me. She puts her father down and she puts her boyfriend down because they both give in to her. But it's me she comes to for support. So that, that's what I've said to her this time when she had me excluded was she kept coming to me asking me for help. And I'd say, well, I can't help you because they won't talk to me. With her current admission, I tried to find out whether she'd been admitted to the unit or not or whether she was in the street in the next town. I was told that she was there, but I'd been specifically excluded from receiving information as I was not the primary carer. And I questioned the term primary carer because I knew all about it. I, I knew the new terms now. And this is someone in the system telling me I'm not the primary carer. And I said, well, no one's the primary carer anymore. <laughs> Her nomination was actually updated during that time when she was made an involuntary patient. 
and all, she only nominated her partner as her designated carer, even though she could nominate two. He was the only one nominated. So after I said, with her asking me for help constantly, and me saying, well, I can't get any information. If you want me to help you, you'll have to add me as a designated carer. Well, we could both be designated carers, your partner and me. And she said, okay, that's fine. So the next time I went to the hospital, I said to her again in front of a partner, um, are you happy to add me as a designated carer? Yes. The partner was there and he understood. I got the nurse to come out. It was in close obs. Got the nurse to come out and I said, Erin um, wants me to be put on as a designated carer now. The nurse just looked at me and she said, are you sure? And I said, well, yes, we've spoken about it here. So then she got my daughter and took her away, asking her, are you sure you want your mother as your designated carer? Mm -hmm. And it's like, <laughs> that's what we're dealing with. That, is, that just to me shows a great lack of respect. Yeah.